<sighs> All right. You want to now? Can we talk about the biography? The biography episode from this past week. Scott Hall, aka Razor Ramon, the man who oozed coolness, according to the Miz. Machismo. He oozed machismo. Well, no, he said he oozed coolness. That's what the Miz said about. Well, what Razor Ramon would say was that he oozed machismo. Well, he, at various points in his life, apparently we've come to find out he was oozing all sorts of things. Uh, <clears throat> you know, here's another guy that I, I didn't know that much about his personal life. I mean, obviously, we've shared uh, numerous locker rooms. I've worked of, in, in matches involving him, etc., but it's not like we sat down and had long conversations. I was not part of the clique. So I didn't know about his personal life, uh, you know, his younger days. I knew about the altercation that he had had, you know, when he was bouncing at the strip club that, you know, with the gun that the guy got shot in uh, vague or, you know, uh, bullet point terms. Is that the kind of thing you had to report? to whatever office you were working for that you had that on your record that that had happened um well <clears throat> i'm thinking i'm th thinking thinking it, like in in the 80s no <laughs> i mean it's not like you ever any promoter ever did a background check they figured if if this guy is fucked up bad enough that we've heard about it from wrestlers you know then we need to watch out but otherwise they never did a background check. So I'm sure when he was working in Florida, work for Crockett, Vern, you know, whatever, when it got to the early 90s WWF, I don't remember, you know, at least when I was in the office, uh, uh, anybody really having a major extensive background check, but like Bam Bam Bigelow, you would have to know that guys couldn't go to Canada or whatever, right? Now, in modern times, I guess they, they run everything, but he wouldn't have had to just go in and say, well, Jim Crockett, yeah, Dusty's bringing me in, but I got to tell you about this thing that happened to me four years ago or whatever. Does that answer your question? That answers my question, yes. Um, and that's why I laugh when I hear some fans apply maybe modern standards or maybe stuff that's not even modern standards yet uh, to 40 years ago. Like, yeah, I was going to do a background check on a fucking job guy, right? But anyway, uh, what I was going to say was the more I see of a lot of these shows, and that's why the John Tenta Dark Side of the Ring to me was so refreshing because, yes, a lot of these shows are centered around people that we're very talented. And then in some cases I may have been a fan of, or, you know, that I've liked on a personal basis or in my interactions with them or whatever, but it's heavy on, yeah, this guy was so talented and he made all this money and he had the world at his feet to give him anything, but goddamn, he fucked up an epic number of times and went to rehab 14 million times. And you know, damaged himself before his time and met a bitter end. It, it's, it's getting, fuck, maybe it's, it, I'm starting to judge everybody because I think of fatigue and weariness over, God damn, could you at any point have taken anybody's advice and help and just straightened the fuck out with all these people? Like, cause that's what they always say. Oh, I love so-and-so. He was great. You know, they're, they're, and his friends are broken up about it, whoever it may be, right? Not speaking specifically here. And then listen to somebody. Jesus Christ, at some point. Because most normal people, they may have the friends that are trying to help them out, but they don't have world-class rehab at their disposal. They didn't get the part about the national TV stars and making you know, shit tons of money and all the pussy and whatever. They maybe just had the shit part where they lost their job and ended up in a goddamn trailer falling over the fucking recliner. So I'm thinking that maybe sometimes these programs overall are making a lot of the boys in the business 
make all the boys in the business look fucking goofy. Do you see what I'm saying here? Do you see where I'm, do you smell what I'm cooking, Brian? Unfortunately, yes. No, I smell what you're, I see the direction you're going in. Let me phrase it like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, th there was no lewd allusion to any kind of graphic bodily function. And do you smell what I'm cooking? You didn't need to goddamn take it anywhere else. But anyway, so that that's starting to color some of my opinions of this of the programming. But they even had they they did have uh, some stuff they shot with Hall in 2014 that has not been used and. They had his brother, which I was not aware he had one. But he was another guy that, you know, as a kid, he saw wrestling. He was an army kid and moved around. But, um, you know, it, it, he was able to go to wrestling with his dad and who was an alcoholic and they weren't particularly close and the parents broke up and he ends up in Florida. And that was at that point, in the late 70s, early 80s, where... You know, everybody in goddamn Orlando either knew about or went to the, you know, weekly matches at the Eddie Graham Sports Stadium, which I worked at once. It was just a giant tin building out in the middle of a field that could seat like 6,000 fucking people. And it just, you can imagine what people screaming sounds like reverberating off a tin roof. And you know he was going to get noticed because look at the size of him and he started the bodybuilding thing and everything. And so it, it I will say was the incident where he's working as a bouncer at a strip club because that's where, you know, guys that size could make money in Florida and still, you know, enjoy Florida and do other shit. But if that had happened, geez, it, it wouldn't have happened if it had been just a bit later because it happened right before he was getting in the business. So if it had been a little bit later, he wouldn't have been there. Or if it had been a little bit earlier, who knows whether that may have, you know, played a part in, in something maybe he didn't fucking, uh, you know, get into business at all. So it was just, it was right there. I don't know the chronology. The incident happened in January, 1983. And, you know, he gets out of there, goes goes to Tampa to train with the guys, but, you know, that was very quick before he got into business. And did you hear he stayed? It was over a girl. He broke his rule and started seeing one of the strippers in the club, and that's some guy that was involved with her came and pulled the gun on him and ended up shot. But he stayed with that girl for eight years. Would you not have made a, an immediate fucking left turn out of that whole situation there, uh, young Brian Last? I mean, it depends. Uh, maybe she was a great person, and of course he just took out the competition. Now you got nothing to worry about. Well, maybe she was a great something. I don't know. I she was I great at math. It, uh, well, it just don't figure. So when you hear about one of these guys that you've had, you know, good and bad things to say about over the years, and good and bad experiences with, and you probably never had a single conversation with him. I mean, you could tell me I'm wrong. No, I have had, uh, but, you know. No, no, but so. about, but specifically about being kids going to wrestling or into wrestling. Oh, no, no. You never think about Scott Hall, the young wrestling fan, wanting to do it. Well, you know, you can actually tell because even when they're, when they're very close to each other, you never hear Nash saying, oh, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a wrestler. Nash had the, the brain for the psychology, but Hall was the best worker of the click bunch at that point in time because he knew what the shit was supposed to look like and had kind of liked it from a fan standpoint. So he, he got what, you know, fans would like and not like and how to do the shit. He, when he found something that he could put himself into, which took a while with all those bad gimmicks. But, you know, that's the thing with... With Hall and Nash and Michaels, and then, you know, Triple H became a part, and then, you know, uh, each one of them individually, talented guys, witty guys, funny guys, whatever, had their their moments. But I think, as I've said before, when they were all together, it brought out the worst in all of them, because then they were all trying to outdo each other as far as who could be the the biggest fucking pain in the ass to work with in some cases. 
Uh, but he, but that's a whole tried hard. He wanted to get in the business. He said he, he, when he moved to Tampa, he joined like five gyms just to, you know, find out where the guys were working out so he could get in with them. And, you know, pretty soon by what early 1985. So he's broke in, trained, had a few matches and, you know, he credited Jack Lanza for who was obviously a, you know, a, a say in the AWA at that point for bringing him to work for Vern. So that all happened in what, a year and a half. And they didn't really say it here or if they did, I missed it. But the story always was that when Vern first saw him, he thought this is my Hulk Hogan because he had just lost Hogan and he was this giant Tom Selleck looking guy. Yeah. And that's why he gave him the inventive nickname of big Scott Hall. Uh, it, it, that's, I remember concurrently with that, that uh, a lot of people, the, the early and underground few number of sheet readers and writers and the smart fan populace was, Oh, this guy's supposed to be the next big deal early on. And, and he looked great. And then as they started seeing him they're like, Oh, and then it became big. Scott Hall became a, a rib, right? For this uh, most boring nickname for the most boring wrestler that we've we've ever seen and and that was i think that's why they glossed over the first five years of his career here at about two minutes of tv time because you know whether it was uh what a dusty's thing with him and spivey was the american starship they were going to be what eagle and coyote wasn't that it coyote yeah which one was coyote and which one was I think Hall must have been Coyote. Hall was Coyote. Yeah, Hall yeah. was Coyote. Um, but he, Dusty had seen him in Florida, obviously, and felt like he had something. And then, and I forgot, that's right, He came, they came real briefly to work for Crockett when Dusty was there before they that Hall went to the AWA. That's right. And then Spivey um, somehow got hired by WWE to become Golden Boy Danny Spivey, and then he became the replacement for Wyndham. There you go. As the blonde-haired member of the U.S. Express. Yeah, because we, we when we came to uh, work for Crockett, we had missed, they were just introducing Spivey as Starship Eagle. And I'm like, what was, What happened to Jefferson? Where's the other Starship? Go, what is this? <laughs> and Coyote was already gone to, to Vern at that point. And, you know, the the bad gimmicks that they gave him, Hall, I mean, in WCW, when when he first got there, which, uh, you know, he called Dallas Page, he said, for help getting in. And they, they come up with the George Michael look, the toothpick, the earring, the diamond stud. Well, remember, he was there before that. He was there in the summer of 89. He was one of the many, many, many people that popped up. He was on the Bash pay-per-view. Oh, fuck, you're right. He was a crocodile hunter or something. Maybe not a hunter, but he was from the Everglades. That's right, he was dressed up like Marlon Perkins. But he was in the uh, the two-ring battle royal at the Bash. Yeah, well, there, there, that was a, a memorable run, as you can tell. But the point is, finally, they start putting the look together. Because he he had just been, like you said, Tom Selleck, just the big generic white guy with the mustache. And they they put the look together, but that was the era of really rotten gimmicks in WCW. And they showed <laughs> Nash as Oz uh, and it glossed that whole WCW run over briefly. And then Bruce takes credit for seeing him on TV and calls Vince and... Hall gets a chance to talk to Vince and says, well, did you ever see Scarface? And there you go. So 30 minutes into this two-hour show, he's already in the WWF in 1992. So that was a you know, pretty quick gloss over of the early years. But you know, from there on, when you think about it, he's, he's Razor or he's himself, and everybody thinks of Razor. Himself was an offshoot of Razor for the rest of his career. And I I couldn't believe even his, they, even his speaking voice. I mean, you could tell that yeah. it kind of got sapped into his speaking voice, where there's a little <laughs> tinge of an accent that he shouldn't have. Well, yo, 
You know, man, it's it's like the thing. I don't know what you that know, is. It was never well, I, yo, I, I, you know, man. What is? That? I don't, I don't know. I can't. I don't know how to do that. Mink the villa over here. All right. See, I'm, I'm, I'm from the, you know, southeastern United States here, where I don't, I just have an, uh, just a flat accent. I don't really have any accent where you can tell anywhere I come from. You see. But anyway, I enjoyed seeing the footage of Vince McMahon directing. <laughs> Hall how to do the razor vignettes. Oh, you get into the character. Okay. Vince always wanted to be goddamn Cecil B. DeMille, didn't he? You know, where yeah. I've I, we all directed every booker or you know, whatever directed people doing promos, but we didn't make it say, well, what would your character say? It, it I'll say this, out of whatever the fuck, right? It, it Vince wanted the Hollywood trappings about the thing. But anyway, Razor Ramon got over, and it seemed like it was a natural gimmick for him. And he he came out of it and was ever, or was was you know always able to get into it and make it more palatable. Even some of the, as they mentioned at one point, the accent at first was kind of a it was an attempt at it. But the people liked the whole package point where they were willing to overlook it. But from these programs, I wish I would never hear the word character mentioned again. I did jot that down. Um, and, and they, you know, they glossed over the, or not glossed over, but went over the high points, the match with the lightning kid, Sean Waltman, that made him the one, two, three kid and got him over. And, you know, the latter match with Sean at WrestleMania 10. And, you know, it, his work in the ring, he really, for a guy that size especially, he could move and he carried that whole deal off. <clears throat> but then again, uh, now but now he starts saying, now that he's, you know, basically a star, he starts getting fucked up after the shows. And you had the quote from Michaels uh, that they justified it by saying, well, we only do this when we're on the road, not when we're home. Well, they were on the road 300 days a year. And that's what his wife says. He couldn't turn it off and he, you know, he couldn't uh, come home and be himself. And he, she wasn't happy being, you know, in that position blah, blah, blah. And uh, you think I mean, more people need hobbies to look forward to no matter what the trade is. If you're someone who's on the road, it shouldn't just be, you look forward to coming home just to be home. Do you think they need things to look forward to doing? Uh, yeah. I will. I mean, yes, you always need to have things to look for, but I always had things to look forward to doing when I came home that didn't involve, you know, getting fucked up the, during my period of time when I was home. I do, or, and or, you know, or coming home to, I always stayed up with wrestling, but I didn't come home to be Jim Cornette in my house. I just, Came home to watch me and all the other people to see if I was still better than they were. Um, but that's you know that was why he went to WCW as as, and we've covered the Hall and Nash's departure in early 1996 when they told Vince one thing to his face and then they faxed him notices and blah blah blah. But he went to WCW for guaranteed money and less dates and. Obviously, for a, a ridiculous amount for the time of guaranteed money that you know has been talked about before in the NWO documentaries and etc. And do the whole outsiders thing. And now, did you did you now hear Hulk say that? Well, now Scott Hall is the one that inspired him to turn heel. Because here he transformed himself. So if he can do it. Is that a new story? I would have to go back through the files and see what he has said and what he hasn't said before. Do we have that on a spreadsheet, Hogan's Lies, to, so we can cross-check that? with? Is it a new one or an existing? Has it been out there in the wild? I don't know. Well, apparently, now Hulk says when when Hall become... In, in, and he didn't even really switch heel, he just changed himself. <laughs> from Razor Ramon to Scott Hall, and that inspired him to turn heel. It inspired him to turn heel 
so he could get in the fucking top heel group that Nash yeah. and Hall had just formed. Bingo, there's the inspiration. These yeah. guys are over, they're cool. I want to be with them. I only want to be with them. So there was lots of praise here of the NWO from all the members of the NWO. And, uh, you know, but then again, he's a, he's home more and he's a good father, but he's not happy with his wife, so he drinks too much. And he was there, and I guess uh, you got to help me. I don't know whether he was... Well, they said he was there for about a year and a half, and then Bischoff said he either needed to fire him or send him to rehab. And then Nash said that he had to quit traveling with him when he got on cocaine. And Waltman said that Hall would go to rehab, and then Waltman would pick him up and drive him home, and, and he'd make him stop at a liquor store on the trip home. So... Was he, because I didn't follow WCW specifically for Scott Hall's comings and goings at that point, he had to be missing a lot between, what, early 98 and the time that they closed down? Was he missing stretches of shows, work, matches, whatever the fuck? Was he just on and off like that? And He was for a while as he was getting as they point out here, messed up, and then they kind of made him getting messed up part of the storyline. So, I guess where I'm going with that is Bischoff, and everybody says, oh, Scott was so cool, we all like Scott. Bischoff sees this guy that he's paying more than, he and Hull had, or he and Nash had the favored nations clause, right? We talked about it the other day. Bischoff had to go to them to get permission when he made the deal to Bret Hart or else was he'd have had to give them a raise. They were supposed to be the highest paid guys. And Bischoff is still allowing this guy to not only make his substance abuse issues an issue with his with the company, sending him to rehab, him coming out and flummoxing that, and him still kowtowing to him about a deal like that, and... Then it, it it at the end of it, making an issue of it on the air, putting it, it as part of the angle. What the fuck kind of? How do you do that on anybody's part? How is anybody putting themselves in that situation? I don't know. And they didn't tell us. And they didn't tell us. So, um, and then everybody to a person that was interviewed said that he was haunted by the shooting. He didn't mean to kill the guy. The guy was trying to kill him and they fought over the gun. So yes, I can understand it being a disturbing incident, but they say he thought he was a bad person. He didn't deserve success. So he either wanted to act like somebody else or sabotage himself or whatever. But at some point, holy Jiminy Christ. So was he there at the end or had he already, they made some remark that he, he took his ball and quit. Uh, it, it, did they give him another rehab ultimatum and he leave before WCW closed or was he there at the end? Do we remember? He may have still been under contract at the end. I don't remember exactly. He may have just, just been home. Yeah. Cause remember um, Vince didn't bring them in right away. The NWO came into WWE, what, a year after WCW closed? Yeah, after after the bloom was off everything they could have got out of the big stars invading. Um, but, you know, Hall goes off the, the deep end with the arrests and et cetera, and that, all that stuff was reported in various places, and they glossed that over kind of. But then when they when they returned to... The WWF, as you said, like a year later after that, they're at WrestleMania, and then he gets fired. And then the multiple mug shots, and his wife divorces him. And they were, they had him on indie dates and, you know, making indie shots fucked up, but they didn't even mention TNA. They glossed over that, which he no-showed TNA a number of times. I think at one time while I was there, they announced he was going to come in and do a pay-per-view, and he no-showed. That's what led to Samoa Joe and Kevin Nash having an argument. 
But anyway, and then they, the the footage that uh, a lot of people have seen in modern days of him in in horrible shape at this indie show where they had to help him into the ring and he tried to throw a punch and fell over and he was just all fucked up and you know the the ESPN profiled him and and they said that I think it was Stephanie said WWE had spent more money on his rehab than anybody else they'd ever sent and but then here comes Diamond Dallas Page and my god the patience that he has for for this stuff um, and uh, Hall went to Atlanta and lived with Paige and cleaned up and went in the Hall of Fame. Again, that was for the, for the NWO, right, in 2014. No, he went he, in as Razor Ramon. Oh, he went in as Razor Ramon, and then they did the, the, the NWO several years later. Right. Is, okay, thank you. But so he goes to the Hall of Fame in 2014, and everybody seems to be happy, and boy, that would be a great place to to end it. And then, apparently still in modern days, they said when COVID hit, well, that was 2020, he said they, he, he couldn't handle sitting home alone. I, I can't fathom the day that I would ever be unhappy sitting home alone. I'm not wired that way. That would that would be my Milton's version of paradise. Um, but anyway, it, it, so they said by the time they went in the Hall of Fame, so it was 2021. I wrote this down for the NWO. He was like passing out there and fucked up, and then you know the next year fell in his house and broke his hip and in the hospital had the heart attacks and and etc and you know again all of his friends just loved him to death hogan was the only one that seemed as if he was acting dramatically and dabbing a fake fucking crocodile tear everybody else was legitimate that they loved him and you just wonder why people that have you know opportunities beyond that of most mortal men can't ever, in a lot of cases, get their shit together. Very talented guy. I was lucky to see him. And, you know, he came in, he got a big push. Razor Ramon came in, he wasn't just some mid-card guy. They put him right into something with Randy Savage. They had him teaming up with Ric Flair. He was in the main event picture right away. And then, early the next year, he was one of the stars of the early days of Raw. And the big Sean Waltman match, he wasn't the Lightning Kid, he was just the kid. They ran through a series of well, names. But, but you know weeks. what? Did you did you see that he still had his lightning kid tights, so he had a lightning bolt with kid underneath it? L right? kid. <laughs> L kid. Yeah, L kid. But uh, no, that was a big moment, and that was a big feud, and Razor Ramon was one of the highlights of WWE while he was there. I mean, even to the very end, I know he hated the Goldberg, uh, not Goldberg, the uh, Goldust stuff. But that's one of the reasons Goldurst, Gold, I can't say his name all Gold the time. Goldurst? Goldurst. Fred Durst's new band. Was he a cousin of Fred Durst? Goldurst? <laughs> one of the reasons that Goldust worked was the Razor Ramon feud. Even yeah. Though Scott Hall hated it, but that's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways he got over right away was that feud. Well, and you know, that's another example of how to make stars. When you bring a guy in and he's presented prominently and featured importantly from the start and wins more than he loses and interacts in a competitive way with with top guys and pretty much dominates people that you know or, or are accustomed to or flunkies that's the way you used to make stars and even the wwe has lost sight of some of that to some extent with the stops and starts of you know, whatever they've been doing over the years. But the other part of that equation, though, is you have to fa have the right guy. You have to have the right person that you're pushing in the right presentation. And as as Hall proved, this when he became Scott Hall and just dropped Razor Ramon and dressed a little differently, it was still that had become him, what he was, to the point where 
when you talk to him, he kind of had a little hitch in his get along in the accent, even if it, it, it well, he was from. I was going to say, know, I was gonna go say Vince tried to shut him down. Remember when he went to WCW, Vince tried to say that the intellectual property of WWE included the toothpick and the accent and stuff was modified because of that. Yeah. Is that what well, he, he had to modify stuff because of the trademark, but so much of that was him or had become him that it kind of came off that way anyway. And that's an example, you know, the, Imagine if The Undertaker had switched companies and tried to be the gravedigger. It wouldn't have worked. But with Hall, it was it was it it was him enough that it was able to be just kind of branched off into a non litigious direction. But then the the that's the problem is he would have so he was young when he got into business in the early eighties. He was in his early twenties. So, fuck, by the time that 2002 came around, his major league career was, I mean, they they tried to bring him back a time or two, and he went to TNA, and he did this and that, but, you know, he only got less than 10 years at the absolute top of the business and was still young when he self-destructed and would have been a commodity for another 10 years at least. He Hall in 2011 when he was being helped to the ring by people because he was so fucked up at an indie show in front of 200 people was was he 50 years old at that point or just barely? There's guys on TV right now making uh, seven figures a year that are 50. Something to think about. He was born in 58. Okay, he was he was fifty two or three, depending on when it was compared to his birthday, which is I believe Christian's there, isn't he? Edge. It reminds me, I was someone said years ago. I forget the exact statistic, but it was like, look at Hall and Nash and WCW. The Von Erichs, if things had gone a different way, would have been the same age approximately if they had lived during the Monday Night Wars, and that's kind of wow. crazy to think about, just in terms of who was where at different points in the business. Von Eric started really young. You know, Hall didn't start until 84, 85, but they would have been the same age. It's kind of crazy. Well, and but nobody had heard of him or he didn't make an impact until the early 90s. So it, they were just barely two different generations, but it seems like so much more time passed in between than, than actually did. Well, that was biography. <laughs>